This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we see what guns and steam engines have to do with each other. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Many engineers of the late 17th century were trying to make use of two new sources of power, steam and gunpowder. By then, England and Europe were under the threat of a serious energy crisis. Most of the trees were gone and the depth of coal mines had reached the underground water table. A reliable power source was badly needed to pump water out of the mines so people could keep heating their homes. No one got very far with gunpowder. But about this time, two Englishmen finally invented workable steam engines. They both came from Devonshire, but they didn't know each other. In fact, one of them, Thomas Savory, was an aristocrat, while the other, Thomas Newcomen, was a blacksmith. The blacksmith, Newcomen, provided the better of the two engines. It produced power when steam was condensed in its cylinder to create a powerful vacuum. From then on, for many years, steam engines operated at low pressures. The first important American steam engine builder was a Philadelphia engineer named Oliver Evans. Evans saw engine building in relation to gun making and made his engines with small high pressure cylinders like gun barrels. His engines weren't very fuel efficient but they were light and they performed well. They were especially well suited to our greatest need which was transportation. And so on a summer's day in 1805 the doors of Evans' Philadelphia workshop swung open and out rolled the most remarkable transportation machine the world had ever seen. It was a gigantic steam-powered behemoth that he called the Eructor Amphibolus, Latin for amphibious dredge. This strange awesome machine could have lumbered straight off the set of a Mad Max movie. It rolled down the streets, around Center Square, and off into the Schuylkill River, where it sailed about for several hours dredging mud. Evans saw beyond gun making to a larger issue, straight through to America's need for powered transportation. In one stroke, this wonderfully inventive man had made one of our first horseless carriages and he'd invented a steamboat two years before Robert Fulton did. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we see how wool weaving led us into the computer age. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Weaving a pattern into cloth is a complicated business. Different shuttles carrying the various weft strands must be passed through the warp strands in a precise repeating order to create the pattern of the weave. In 1805, the French textile engineer Jacquard invented a remarkable scheme for interweaving the strands in a predetermined sequence without the help of a human operator. He passed a chain of cards with holes punched in them in front of a mechanism that reached through the holes to pick up threads. The Jacquard loom was a terrific success, and many of today's power looms still use the same principle. Five years later, a young man named Charles Babbage enrolled in Cambridge University to study mathematics and mechanics. His progress was astonishing, and in 1816, at the age of only 25, he was made a fellow of the Royal Society on the basis of his work on the design of calculating machines and methods. In 1834, he went a step beyond his work on calculators and conceived of a machine that would do much more. He conceived of a machine that could be told how to carry out a sequence of related calculations. He conceived of programmable computation. He never completely finished building this analytical engine, as he called it, but he put us on the road to today's digital computer. Now, what does this have to do with weaving? Well, the key to operating any computer lies in transmitting sequences of on-off commands. Babbage used jacquard-style punched cards to do this. The presence or absence of a hole communicated a simple on-off command to the machine. 
and until very recently, we still used punch cards to transmit our instructions to computers. Good ideas turn and change and flow. So the genius of the textile engineer Jacquard and of the 19th century inventor Babbage is alive today in our high-speed digital computers, changing and turning, but still having a hand in revolutionizing our lives 150 years later. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we meet two men who flew a thousand years ago. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The 12th century English historian William of Malmesbury records an event that took place just after the year 1000. He tells us in these words about the Anglo-Saxon monk Eilmer of Wiltshire Abbey. Eilmer was a man learned for those times, and in his youth had hazarded a deed of remarkable boldness. He had, by some means, I scarcely know what, fastened wings to his hands and feet, so that, mistaking fable for truth, he might fly like Daedalus and, collecting the breeze on the summit of a tower, he flew for more than the distance of a furlong. But, agitated by the violence of the wind and swirling of the air, as well as by awareness of his rashness, he fell, broke his legs, and was lame ever after. He himself used to say that the cause of his failure was forgetting to put a tail on the back part. In other words, this almost unknown monk actually achieved a modestly successful glider flight over a distance of two football fields including the end zones. In fact, the story is given credence by the fact that Eilmer eventually crashed because his glider didn't have a tail to provide lateral stability. How often we think of flight as something that's occurred only in the lifetime of people who are still living. Yet not only the dream of flight but the fact of it as well has been with us for millennia. The American historian Lynn White digs deeper and finds that Eilmer's flight had its own historical antecedents. He finds two somewhat sketchy accounts that indicate a glider flight was made in the year 875 by a Moorish inventor named Ibn Firnas, living in Cordoba, Spain. It's entirely possible that word of Ibn Firnas' flight was brought to Eilmer by returning crusaders. An important thing about Eilmer's and Ibn Firnas' inventions of the glider is that both occurred in intellectual environments that fostered invention. Ibn Firnas lived during the golden age of Islamic art and science, and Eilmer belonged to the Benedictine order, which saw God himself as a master craftsman. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we meet a Bavarian Count who was born in Massachusetts. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Benjamin Thompson was raised in pre-revolutionary New England. He wrestled out a homemade education in Boston and when he was only 18, went off to Rumford, Massachusetts as the new schoolmaster. He soon married a wealthy 31-year-old widow and he took up spying on the colonies for the British. He deserted his wife and a new daughter to flee to England when he was found out. Thompson devoted the next several years to shameless social climbing that eventually put him in a high-ranking position with the Bavarian court in Munich. It was here that his life took on a different coloration. He boldly combined technical insight with social reforms that were years before their time. He instituted public works, military reforms, and poor houses, and he equipped them with radical kitchen heating and lighting systems. In 1792, he was made a count of the Holy Roman Empire, and he took the name of his old town of Rumford 
Our main interest in Count Rumford arises out of experiments he made five years later. His interest in field artillery led him to study both the boring and firing of cannons. Out of this work, he saw that mechanical power could be converted to heating, that there was a direct equivalence between thermal energy and mechanical work. People at the time thought that heat energy was a fluid, a kind of ether called caloric that flowed in and out of materials. Caloric couldn't be created by mechanical work or by any other means. Of course, Rumford's radical discovery flew in the teeth of the caloric theory. His story eventually took a last ironic turn. Caloric had been given its name by the famous French chemist Lavoisier, who was beheaded during the French Revolution. When Rumford returned to England and France, he became involved in a four-year affair with Lavoisier's widow that ended in a disastrous and short-lived marriage. Before the marriage, Rumford crowed, I think I shall live to drive Caloric off the stage as the late Lavoisier drove away the previous theory. What a singular destiny for Madame Lavoisier. He did indeed drive Caloric off the stage, but I suppose it's no surprise that the marriage failed. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we attend the wedding of science and technology. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The early 17th century philosopher Francis Bacon started a very important change in people's thinking when he suggested that science should serve technology. In 1620 he wrote, The empire of man over things is founded on the sciences, for nature is only to be commanded by obeying her. We accept that advice today, but in 1620 scientists and the people who built things lived in different worlds. The modern engineer only came into existence after the people who made things had joined forces with the people who studied physical principles. The first time in European history that this happened was just after Bacon told us that nature is only to be commanded by obeying her. And it happened because people wanted to improve the accuracy of clocks. A mechanical clock depends on a mechanism called an escapement that moves back and forth in a steady rhythm. In 1585, most escapements were masses on the ends of a rod that rhythmically swung back and forth. But in 1585, Galileo showed that the period of oscillation of a gently swinging pendulum was always the same, regardless of the amplitude of its swing. The pendulum stood to make an ideal escapement device because it always swings at the same speed, even while it runs down. In 1641, Galileo's son, Vincenzo, built the first clock that used a pendulum escapement. The Dutch and English physicists, Christian Huygens and Robert Hooke, followed Vincenzio's work later in the 1600s with improved theories of the pendulum and better clock designs. The pendulum escapement was the first technological innovation that resulted directly from the application of a scientific principle, and it was actually carried out by the most important scientists of the day. Since then, we've listened to Bacon's assertion that we must bend to nature, understand nature, if we're to control her. Today's engineers are trained to the teeth in science. Our aim is to make things, but we know that we have to submit to nature before we try to command her. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we ride the first successful steamboat. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. American school children learn about Robert Fulton's invention of the steamboat. In 
Actually, what Fulton did was to locate one of the efficient new Watt engines in a warehouse in 1807. He installed it in a well-designed boat and created an immediate commercial success. But when he patented his steamboat, he acknowledged 30 years of earlier work by other people. Fulton had access to a lot of new technology by 1807, and he put his boat together with an ease that would have been unimaginable just a few years before. Our story of the first successful steamboat begins in France, with two of Louis XIV's artillery officers passing time in camp talking about the possible use of steam to power boats. One of them, the Count d'Auxiron, resigned his commission in 1770 to work full-time on a boat. By 1772, he'd talked the French government into promising they'd give the first successful steamboat builder an exclusive license to operate the boat for 15 years. Dogziron installed one of the monstrous old-fashioned Newcomen steam engines in a boat. The engine was so heavy that it sank the boat in the Seine River, and after three years of the resulting lawsuits, Dogziron died of apoplexy. That could have been the end of it, but while Dogziron was at work, Another young nobleman, the Marquis de Jouffoy, had been thrown into the military prison on the island of Saint Marguerite in connection with a duel. That's the same prison where the famous Man in the Iron Mask had been held. During several years of enforced contemplation, he watched boats in the river and thought about Dogziron's attempt. When he was released in 1775, Jouffoy made contact with Dogziron and his supporters. He rapidly decided that they were on the wrong track and he left Paris for the town of Lyon to continue the work alone. He developed his own improved version of a Newcomen engine and, in 1783, made a trial run of a new 150-foot-long boat on the Saône River. The boat motored past cheering crowds for 15 minutes until its hull sprang a leak. Jouffoy eased it to shore before anyone spotted the failure, and, on that fine June day, he bowed to receive the ovation of the crowd. He sent affidavits testifying to his success to Paris, and he waited. After a long debate, the French Academy of Sciences decided that the town of Lyon could never have made a success of something that had failed in Paris, and they denied him the license. Then, a few years later, the French Revolution drove him out of the country. It wasn't a happy ending for Jouffoy, but his stubborn, irrepressible, driving genius led to the creation of the machine that was soon to open up the western United States. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we meet a special figure in early air warfare. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The first military airplanes to take the air in World War I had just one purpose, scouting enemy positions and movements. Still, it was no time at all before the pilots of these planes looked for ways to shoot each other out of the sky. The first kills were made with pistols and rifles fired off to the side. Then movable machine guns were operated by backseat observers. But it was soon apparent that forward firing machine guns would be a lot more effective. The British mounted the first forward firing guns on the upper wing where they could fire over the propeller blade. But they were hard to aim and almost impossible to fix when they jammed in flight. The French then put metal deflectors on the propeller so that the pilot could fire straight through the blades, with a few bullets glancing off them. That worked, but it eventually damaged the crankshaft. As the story is told, one of these French planes was captured by the Germans who handed it over to the handsome young airplane designer, Anthony Fokker, on a Tuesday evening. That Friday, Fokker came back with the first interrupter device, a mechanism connected to the engine that turned the gun off each time a propeller blade passed through the line of fire. Fokker's device worked well enough in a ground test, but the German officers wanted a combat demonstration. They wrapped Fokker, a Dutch civilian, in a German uniform and bundled him off to the front. Fokker took off in a monoplane of his own design and soon enough spotted a two-seater Allied scout below him. He put his plane in an attack dive and located the scout in his sights. 
Then the reality of the situation registered on Fokker. He was about to kill two people. He turned sick to his stomach and flew back to the aerodrome without firing a shot. Fokker vowed not to fly in combat again and returned to his factory. From then on, he provided Germany with the advanced airplanes that killed most of the thousands of Allied pilots who died during the rest of the war. They called his interrupter mechanism the Fokker Scourge. Just after the war, his civilian airplane designs were widely used in the United States. My father, who'd been an Allied pilot, met him here and remarked what a nice fellow he was. I'm John Leinhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we'll go back to Pittsburgh, 170 years ago. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Now, what was so special about Pittsburgh and the year 1816? Well, the War of 1812 had just ended. We'd survived our first 40 years of independence, and we started to see ourselves as a strong and solvent country. Pittsburgh was a singular town. It lay across that great natural barrier, the Allegheny Mountains, far from Americans' population centers on the Atlantic coast. It was also important because it was centered in the western Pennsylvania coal fields. It's cheaper to bring iron to coal for smelting than to bring coal to iron. So Pittsburgh became our major iron producer soon after the first western Pennsylvania blast furnace was set up in 1790. It became our major glass producer, too, because glassmaking also requires a lot of heat. Between 1810 and 1820, Pittsburgh's population mushroomed from 4,700 to more than 7,000. The odd thing is that Pittsburgh was so inaccessible. It sits at the confluence of the Allegheny and the Monongahela rivers, which connected to the ocean at New Orleans, over a thousand miles away. It took over two weeks for a loaded wagon to make the 300-mile road trip over the mountains to Philadelphia. Yet, in a few years, Pittsburgh had acquired three newspapers, nine churches, three theaters, a piano maker, five glass factories, three textile mills, a steam engine factory, 4,000 tons of iron processing per year, two rolling mills, most of our nail production, and, no surprise, a notorious air pollution problem. Robert Fulton's steamboat patent was only seven years old in 1816. In that year, this inland city launched three of these gigantic boats to link itself to the ocean, and they weren't its first. Another boat, made two years earlier in Pittsburgh and bearing the unfortunate name of Vesuvius, burned up in New Orleans in 1816. These words from an article in the September 3rd issue of the Pittsburgh Gazette say a lot about the mood of the place. Those who first cross the Atlantic in a steamboat will be entitled to a great portion of applause. In a few years we expect such trips will be common, and bold will be they who first make passage to Europe in a steamboat. In fact, the first transatlantic steamboat crossing was made, with the help of some sail, just three years later, in 1819. This article ends with a quotation from Homer. Bold was the man, the first who dared to brave in fragile bark the wild, perfidious wave. That's the mark of a developing civilization. Healthy, adventurous technologies driven by that kind of awe and excitement. I'm John Leinhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's talk about monks and water wheels. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The Cistercian monastic order was founded in the year 1098. By 1098, the water wheel had just revolutionized Western Europe by providing a cheap and convenient power source. 
it had replaced the back-breaking labor of grinding grain, fulling wool, and sawing wood that had been the beginning and end of most people's lives. When St. Bernard took over the order 14 years later, he moved it in a direction that would complete the change of European civilization that the water wheel had begun. You see, the Cistercians were a strict branch of the Benedictine order who fled worldly commerce to live, and I quote, remote from the habitation of man. But under St. Bernard, they achieved this life by setting up an economic independence based on the highest technology of the day. By the middle of the 12th century, the Cistercians had reached the cutting edge of hydropower and agricultural technology. A typical monastery straddled an artificial stream brought in through a canal. The stream ran through the monastery shops, living quarters, and refectories, providing power for milling, wood cutting, forging, and olive crushing. It also provided running water for cooking, washing, and bathing, and finally for sewage disposal. These monasteries were, in reality, the best organized factories the world had ever seen. They were versatile and diversified. Of course, they represented a rather strange way of living remote from the habitation of man, but that's another matter. We're too often told that this period of history was a dark age. The reason is that the people who wrote medieval political history were remote from the world of making things. The scribes of the kings wrote about armies and slaughter. They didn't devote much time to the engineers who were really changing the world. And the engineers of the Cistercian order didn't just develop this new technology, but they also spread it throughout Europe during the 12th and 13th centuries. Their 742 monasteries were major agents of change that completely altered medieval life. I'm John Leinhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the Friends of KUHF. Today we look at a medieval institution, namely the Wild and Woolly West. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Our American West developed its own characteristic technologies for daily life. We all know the flavor. Log cabins, windmills, card games, barbed wire, heavy horse-drawn wagons, whiskey, large saddles, and I might ominously add, death by hanging. The historian Lynn White points us to a startling feature of all these technologies. Log cabins were a medieval form of housing. The earlier Romans and later Europeans used much different building technologies. The Romans and later Europeans drank beer and wine, but whiskey was the medieval drink of choice. Romans and 18th century gamesmen used dice, but you'd find only cards in medieval or western saloons. That sort of comparison can be made right down the line. The Romans executed people by crucifixion, and the later Europeans used beheading and shooting, but strangulation, hanging, was the standard medieval punishment. This strange parallel grows more puzzling when we learn that the middle-class settlers of New England tried to recreate what they'd left behind instead of looking for the most efficient technologies. They went straight away to the beam and plank house construction they'd left in England, when log houses would have made much better sense. But the settlers of the West were generally the European poor, peasants, workmen, and people who'd lived away from the sophisticated centers of Europe. They had generally been closer to the technologies of the Middle Ages. But more than that, these people found their way more quickly to the sort of rough-hewn ways that worked so well in both the medieval world and the undeveloped West. They were also people who held little nostalgia for their lives in Europe. The technology of the 10th to the 13th centuries was wonderfully direct, practical, and inventive, and so too were the Western immigrants. Another characteristic of both medieval and Western life was that they both tended to be open to change and variety. The Old West thus provides us with an oddly accurate mirror of medieval life, but it also gives us a picture of a very effective adaptation by free and inventive people to new circumstances. I'm John Leinhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. <laughs> 
This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's turn on the first electric lights. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. If I say light bulb, you'll probably think Edison. Yet the idea of electric lighting was around for hundreds of years before Edison, and it really got rolling just after 1800, almost 80 years before Edison. I should explain that two different kinds of electric lamps competed with each other through the 19th century. One was the incandescent lamp, where light was created by passing an electric current through a filament. The other was arc light. The brilliant electrochemist Humphrey Davy was probably the first to give us lights of both kinds. The 22-year-old Davy was made a lecturer at the new Royal Institution in London in 1801. He was a dazzling speaker, and his lecture demonstrations soon became major social events in London. In an 1802 lecture, he showed that he could cast light by passing an electric current through a platinum strip. In an 189 lecture, he imposed a large voltage across an air gap between two carbon electrodes and created the first arc lamp. Commercial arc lighting systems followed three decades later in England. For a long time, arc lighting was more showy than practical. These systems were just getting good when Edison came along. Meantime, in 1820, the French inventor, De La Rue, made a successful incandescent lamp using a platinum coil in an evacuated glass tube. And in 1840, the Englishman Grove used similar lamps to illuminate a whole theater. But we're told that the theater lighting was dim, and its cost ran to several hundred pounds per kilowatt hour. Many, many more incandescent lamps followed, and in 1878, an inventor named Joseph Swan made an evacuated carbon filament lamp, three years before Edison did, and he managed to get some patent protection in place before Edison duplicated the feat. When Edison finally installed a complete incandescent lighting system on the steamship Columbia in 1880, he provided cheaper, longer-lasting bulbs than anyone else had in a commercially viable lighting system, complete with an effective electrical supply. To get around Swan, Edison simply took the fellow in as a business partner. Edison's real strength lay in his tenacity in fully developing an idea all the way to the marketplace. But we owe a large debt of gratitude to those marvelous, inventive, too often forgotten people who came up with the first electric lights. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's talk about some words. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The words science, technology, and engineering take such a kicking about. Who makes a spaceship go up? A scientist, a technologist, or an engineer? Who takes the blame if it fails? Maybe we should look closer at the words before we try to answer. The word science comes from the Latin word scienta, which means knowledge. We apply the word science to ordered or systematic knowledge. A scientist identifies what's known about things and puts that knowledge into some kind of order. Part of the word technology goes back to a nice Greek word, techni. Techni means art and skill, what a painter, stonemason, millwright, or glassblower might do. But the other part of the word is its ending, ology, which means the study or the lore or even the science of something. Technology is the lore or the science of techni, of making and doing. Technology is separate from the actual act of glass blowing or machining. It's the knowledge of these things. Our language would be a lot clearer if we could reclaim the old Greek word techni for the actual act of making and doing. The last of the three words, engineering, comes from the Latin word ingeniare, which means to devise. A lot of other English words are related to this word. Ingenuity, which means inventiveness, and engine, which can be taken to mean any machine of our devising, any 
engine of our ingenuity. So an engineer is, first and foremost, a devisor of machines. For about 300 years, science and techni have joined forces. The latter-day engineer is a technologist who is well-schooled in science and who can make effective use of it when he tries to create the engines of his ingenuity. Which of the three, scientist, technologist, or engineer, reaps the credit or blame for a spaceship? The answer, of course, is that the question is no good. The three functions of techni, science, and invention together make a spaceship. Of course, engineers combine these functions. One behaves more like a craftsman, a user of techni, while another behaves more like a scientist, refining background information for designers. But a person earns the title engineer when the goal of his labors is the actual creative design process, when he combines a knowledge of techni with science to achieve invention. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we see how an observer looked at power technology 160 years ago. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The Reverend Dionysus Lardner wrote technical handbooks in the early 19th century. His book, The Steam Engine, familiarly explained and illustrated, was published in 1827. That was 40 years after James Watt had changed the world with his wonderful new steam engines. The book includes everything from a history of the steam engine to rules for railway investment speculators. But when Lardner speaks from the past about the power-producing potential of this new machine, we see real vision combined with the optimism and short-sightedness we share today. In a recent report, he says, it was announced that a steam engine erected in Cornwall had raised 125 millions of pounds one foot high with a bushel of coals. The Great Pyramid of Egypt weighs 13 billion pounds. To construct it cost the labor of 100,000 men for 20 years. Today it could be raised by the consumption of 479 tons of coals. He goes on to say, the enormous consumption of coals in the arts and manufactures and in steam navigation has excited the fears of exhaustion of our minds. These apprehensions, however, may be allayed by the assurance of the highest mining and geological authorities that the coal fields of Northumberland and Durham alone are sufficient to supply the present demand for 1,700 years, and the great coal basin of South Wales will supply the same demand for 2,000 years longer. Those reserves do little today to satisfy England's energy needs. Is Lardner's failure to recognize our constant craving for more familiar? Well, so's what comes next. In speculations like these, the progress of improvement and discovery ought not be overlooked. Philosophy already directs her finger at sources of inexhaustible power. We are on the eve of mechanical discoveries still greater than any which have yet appeared. Lardner so wonderfully combined vision with over-optimism. He certainly underestimated our appetites, but he correctly perceived the somewhat terrifying fact that human ingenuity will do more than we dare dream to meet our frivolous wants as well as our real needs. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the Friends of KUHF. Today we meet a sad American inventor. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. John Fitch was born in 1743 in Connecticut. His mother died when he was four. His father was harsh and rigid. A sense of injustice and failure marked his life from the start. Pulled from school when he was eight and made to work on his hated family farm, he became, in his own words, almost crazy after learning. 
he finally fled the farm and took up silversmithing. He married in 1776, but soon left his nagging wife, who couldn't bear his manic depressive extremes. For several years he explored the Ohio River Basin, spent time as a prisoner of the British and Indians, and eventually returned to Pennsylvania afire with a new obsession, to make a steam-powered boat to navigate the western rivers. In 1785 and 6, Fitch and a competing builder named Rumsey looked for money to build steamboats. The methodical Rumsey gained the support of George Washington and the U.S. government. But Fitch found private support and then rapidly reinvented a sort of Watt engine, moving from mistake to mistake until he produced America's first successful boat ahead of Rumsey. It was an odd machine, propelled by a set of Indian canoe paddles. Yet by the summer of 1790, Fitch used it in a successful passenger line between Philadelphia and Trenton. He logged some 3,000 miles at 6 to 8 miles an hour that summer. But in the end, it failed commercially. People just didn't take it seriously. All they saw was a curiosity, a stunt. And Fitch, possibly because of his personality extremes, couldn't sustain his financial backing. This failure broke Fitch. He retired to Bardstown, Kentucky, and struck a deal with the local innkeeper. For 150 acres of land, the man agreed to put him up and give him a pint of whiskey every day while he drank himself to death. When that failed, Fitch put up another 150 acres to raise the dose to two pints a day. When that failed, Fitch finally gathered enough opium pills to do himself in. They'd called him Crazy Fitch, and now they buried him under a footpath in the central square. In 1910, the DAR finally put a marker over the spot identifying him as a veteran of the American Revolution. I'm haunted by the picture of this six-foot-two figure in a beaver-skin hat and a black frock coat stumbling the streets of Bardstown, the butt of children's jokes, unable to see that his dream had not failed. History honors Fitch far better than he honored himself, for it was he who set the stage for Robert Fulton. He made it clear that powered boats were feasible. A person who wants to function creatively has to function at risk. Watt and Fulton took risks and won big, but not before they, too, had suffered failure. The trick, of course, is to lose one day and come back to win the next. And that's what happens when we take a healthy pleasure and confidence in our creative processes. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we look at early telegraphy. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Historians of technology are pretty cautious about naming the first person to invent anything. Someone else always shows up having thought of it first. The telegraph is no exception. The noted American painter Samuel F. B. Morse did put together a telegraph system in 1837, but it was probably his invention of an early version of what we call the Morse code that got him credited with inventing the telegraph. The seed for the telegraph was sown some 90 years earlier, in 1747, when the Englishman William Watson showed that electrostatically generated signals could be sent a long way through a wire with the circuit being completed through the earth. In 1753, an anonymous writer published a magazine article showing how it was possible to use an array of 26 such wires, one for each letter of the alphabet, to send messages over long distances. Various forms of this multiple wire system were built in Switzerland in 1774, in France in 1787, and in Spain in 1798. The notion of sending all the letters on a single wire, of using a code to distinguish them, was introduced in 1774, about 60 years before Morse, by a French inventor named Lesage. Still, multiple wire systems weren't completely abandoned for several decades. The whole business got a big boost with the invention of the storage battery. With battery power, people could drive all kinds of output signals, like magnets and marks on litmus paper. Between 1800 and Morse's work in 1837, many telegraph systems were developed, and a lot of them weren't bad. In 
it's worth asking how Morse got the credit he did. Well, his code was the best one up to that time, and his system had the essential features for a commercial success, although few of these features were unique. But we must recognize that Morse was a man involved in a remarkable range of self-expressive activities, in art, invention, politics, and photography, the list goes on. Beyond that, he was combative, and he got into controversies in all these fields. When it came to fighting for telegraph patent priority, Morse was very effective. In 1854, he won a Supreme Court decision that gave him most of the telegraph royalties. To his credit, he died as a wealthy philanthropist. But don't forget, the idea of the telegraph was given us by an anonymous writer in 1753, a person whose reward was the fun of having dreamed up a wonderful new idea, an anonymous inventor whose reward was having given that idea away to the world. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we ask a chicken and egg question. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Does the human mind drive our technology or does technology drive the human mind? When we talk about our technology, we normally sound as though we believe ourselves to be in control. But when we look at recent discoveries of cultural anthropologists, we find something quite different to be true. The anthropologist who wants to know if a particular ape skull should be called human looks around it for evidence of serious tool-making. If he finds that evidence, he calls the animals human. There's a strong view that we shouldn't call humans homo sapiens, or man the wise, but rather homo technologicus, or man the user of technology. But there's more to it than that we find that the physiological development of the opposed thumb and the ability to free the hand by assuming a squatting position came just before tool-making. But then we find that the earliest tool-making was still done by beasts whose skulls didn't accommodate much brain. The thinking abilities of the beast took a great leap forward only after it once had tools. What the anthropologists tell us is that technology has driven our brains, our expanded physical capabilities made technology, extended tool-making, inevitable. They tell us that technology has expanded our minds and fed itself. That state of affairs goes on today. Who on this planet would be bright enough to invent a microcomputer? Who, in fact, did invent the microcomputer? The answer is that nobody did. In a very real sense, it invented itself. At each point in its evolution, the machine revealed more and more of its potential to us. At each stage, it exposed one more step that this or that person recognized and leaped to complete. You see, our heritage is twofold. We have a genetic heritage and we have a cultural heritage, and both of them shape us. Technology, the study of making things, is a key part of our cultural heritage. The tools, implements, and machines around us enfold us and instruct us from birth. The engines of our ingenuity teach us just as surely as a professor or a book does. So the existential fun of engineering arises out of an interaction between our own inventiveness and the technology that surrounds and drives our thinking. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we meet a remarkable father and son. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The British art historian Kenneth Clark coined the term heroic materialism to describe the engineering of the middle 19th century. 
Those engineers were melodramatic artists in iron, and Isambard Kingdom Brunel was the grandest of them all. His father, Sir Mark Isambard Brunel, was born in France in 1769 and died in England in 1849. At first, Mark Brunel's work was part of the wave of building characteristic of the Industrial Revolution, but he made his mark in the history books with great works of civil engineering, an early suspension bridge, the first floating ship landing platform, and, boldest of all, a tunnel under the Thames River, the first construction of its kind and one that required a whole new set of accompanying technologies. The person he put in charge of the tunnel was his 20-year-old son. The tunnel was begun in 1825 and completed in 1843 after a collapse killed many workers, seriously injuring the younger Brunel, and it halted work for seven years. Yet, the completed tunnel still serves London today. The son, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, went on to become the prototypical 19th century engineer. He built the famous two-mile-long box tunnel, several major suspension and arch bridges, 1,000 miles of railway, and with each project, he expanded civil engineering techniques far beyond anything that had been known or imagined. But his crowning achievements were his steamships. In 1837, he produced the paddle-driven Great Western, one of the first transatlantic steamboats in regular service. He followed it with a screw propeller-driven steamship called the Great Britain. Then he bit off a mouthful that not even he could chew. In 1853, he began work on the Great Eastern, the grandest ship the world had ever seen, designed to take 4,000 passengers to Australia and back without refueling, it was 700 feet long, and it weighed 20,000 tons. The Great Eastern was launched in 1858, and Brunel died of stress and overwork the next year. It was all it was meant to be with one catch. It was only one quarter as fuel efficient as Brunel had expected, and that killed it as a passenger liner. But it did find its place in history when it proved to have the ideal capacities for laying the first transatlantic telegraph cable. The younger Brunel really trod the world in seven-league boots of his own making. He made engineering larger than life and set the mood for the technology of his century. Never before or since have we reached such glorious self-confidence in our ability to make the unimaginable. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we learn what some contemporary poets had to say about the Industrial Revolution. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Not everyone who is charmed by the movie Chariots of Fire knows the source of its title. Actually, it's a phrase from an English hymn that's sung rather briefly near the beginning of the movie. The words by the poet William Blake at first seemed to portray the Industrial Revolution as a manifestation of human evil. He says, And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? Robert Burns reacted in much the same way when he saw the fire and smoke of the Carron Iron Works in 1787. We came not here to view your works in hopes to be more wise, but only lest we go to hell, it may be no surprise. By the early 19th century, a kind of environmental movement had arisen in England. It took the form of romantic naturalism. Nature had never looked very pretty to people who spent their life locked in combat with it, but as the works of man started to cover it up, poets and artists began to make nature into something it had never quite been. For Sir Walter Scott, nature was dark and gothic. Farewell to the forests and wild hanging woods. Farewell to the torrents and loud pouring floods. And for his contemporary Percy Shelley, it was gentler. Sweet oracles of woods and dells and summer winds in sylvan cells. Hellish mills were indeed replacing the wild natural beauty of Scott's world and the sweet natural beauty of Shelley's. But it was William Blake who also said that nature without man is barren. 
he understood that we are ultimately responsible for reclaiming nature. His Chariots of Fire text ends like this. Bring me my bow of burning gold, bring me my arrows of desire, bring me my spear, O clouds unfold, bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. He's outlining our responsibility. We must not shrink from mental fight till we've built a world fit for habitation. When Blake asks for his bow, his arrows, his spear, and his chariot of fire, he's reaching for the tools with which to build a better world. He's arming for mental fight, and that's what we have to do. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we'll go to a Victorian exhibition. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Early in her reign, Queen Victoria and her consort Albert hit on the plan of creating a great worldwide exhibition of modern art and design. Sir Joseph Paxton, a botanist and landscape designer, won the task of designing the Central Exhibition Hall, and the building he produced is still talked about by architects. In 1851, Paxton erected his Crystal Palace, an amazing glass and iron pavilion over a third of a mile long with 800,000 square feet of floor space. The construction was an avant-garde cantilevered iron frame with interchangeable prefabricated parts and acres of glass panels. It was certainly influenced by the greenhouses he'd designed earlier, and, he claimed, the specific structure imitated the organic design of the Amazon lily, Victoria Regia. That's all well and good, but the great Victorian engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel, himself a worker of wonders in the medium of iron, greatly admired the Crystal Palace because it was so clearly based on solid engineering principles, some of which he'd established. The exhibition drew over six million visitors and was a wonderful success until it was finally dismantled in 1854. It nevertheless represented a peculiar confusion of design styles. Inside this functional array of straight lines were stuffed the busy, rounded works of art from earlier eras. 18th century Rococo, turn-of-the-century naturalism, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But the power of the exhibition lay in the element of art that was less explicit, the engineering of it. Victorian art and design lumbered on in their own ponderous and somewhat claustrophobic way, while Victorian engineering lay its hold on the entire world. The simple truth was that engineering was the major art of the middle 19th century, something 20th century functionalists would later admit. In the final analysis, it was the exhibit hall itself, far more than its contents, that captured our imaginations. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we look at a genetic mutation that gave birth to our technological civilization. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. To fulfill our destiny as a species of builders and makers, we first had to leave hunting and gathering to take up farming. The scientist and historian Jacob Bronowski tells a remarkable tale of plant genetics that suggests this change came down to a key flash of human ingenuity. Archaeological evidence makes it clear that two stages of genetic mutation set the stage. Before 8000 BC, the ancestor of wheat more closely resembled a wild grass than the heavy grain-bearing plant we eat today. Then a mutation occurred in which this plant was crossed with another grass. The result was a fertile hybrid called emmer, with edible seeds that blew in the wind and sowed themselves. The hunting-gathering tribes took to harvesting and eating these seeds. 
but they didn't have to worry about planting emmer because it sowed itself. Then a remarkable thing happened. A second genetic mutation occurred sometime between 8 and 6,000 B.C. This mutation yielded something very close to our modern wheat, with its much plumper grain. It may have happened many times before that, but if it did, we had no way of knowing, because wheat doesn't blow in the wind and it can't sow itself. A mutation, even a fertile one, couldn't survive on its own. Modern wheat only survives in a symbiotic relationship with humans. Without someone to harvest it and plant it, it dies away. But somehow, some very clever person spotted one of these mutations of emmer and recognized the potential of collecting and manually replanting the seeds. A hunter-gatherer conceived of farming. This pivotal event in human history happened rather close to the beginning of biblical chronology, the chronology of humankind once it had taken up farming. This was the prototypical act of a kind of technological creativity that's gone on ever since. Someone happened across an oddity, in this case a stalk of fat grain that couldn't ride the wind, and he saw possibility within it. That person saw how to cast what was evident into a new arrangement and to gain a result that was not evident at all. I'm John Leinhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we ride in an airship. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Powered air transport took two very different forms, heavier than air flight and lighter than air flight. Heavier than air flight has developed steadily, but lighter than air transport seems for the moment to have come and gone. The grand hotels that buoyed gently through the skies in the early 20th century have completely vanished. Little more than advertising blimps survive. The first successful powered balloon flight was made by a French steam engine designer, Giffard, in 1854. He mounted a three-horsepower steam engine of his own design on a 147-foot-long balloon and chuffed away at six miles per hour on a three-hour ride over the suburbs of Paris. Many powered balloon flights were made during the next half century, and in 1900, Henry Deutsch, a French financier, offered 100,000 francs in prize money to the first person who could fly the 14-mile course from the Paris Aero Club around the Eiffel Tower and back in 30 minutes. The two leading contenders were the young Brazilian Santos Dumas and the German Count von Zeppelin. Santos Dumas just barely won the prize in 1901, but he soon lost hope for lighter-than-air flight. To propel a dirigible balloon through the air, he complained, is like trying to push a candle through a brick wall. He turned to heavier-than-air flight and, in 1906, was the first European to fly an airplane. But Count von Zeppelin went on to develop the rigid dirigible into a glorious machine. He was flying passengers by 1910 and achieving remarkable popularity in Germany. In its enthusiasm, the public completely forgave Zeppelin's spectacular failures. His dirigibles weren't too effective as warships in World War I, but after the war, he began transoceanic service with really grand airships. The grandest of these was the Hindenburg. Completed in 1936, it was just a little shorter than the Queen Mary. It served 50 passengers and crossed the Atlantic in two and a half days. This two-story flying hotel had staterooms, a lounge, a promenade, a dining room that offered venison and roast gosling, all the amenities anyone might wish. When the Hindenburg caught fire and burned in Lakehurst, New Jersey in 1937, that put an end to the great dirigibles. Santos Dumas, it seemed, had made the right choice. Rather than tackle the problems of making hydrogen-filled balloons safe, people abandoned them and went with the airplane. But who, crammed like a sardine on a transatlantic jet and suffering jet lag, doesn't look back at the gentle elegance of these quiet monsters and wonder about the complex factors that influenced this particular decision? I'm John Leinhard, 
at the University of Houston where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we see where the first American iron came from. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Iron. What an elementary need for a new civilization trying to find its way out of the wilderness. The first American iron ore was found in 1585 on an island off the North Carolina coast. It was too inaccessible to mine, but iron ore that could be mined was found in Virginia in 1607. When the colonists sent a shipload off to England, they found it just wasn't efficient to ship unsmelted ore that far. A company finally set up an American iron smelting operation near Richmond in 1622, and then the Indians massacred the whole group just before it went into production. So the first American iron ore was finally produced in 1644 on the Saugus River just north of Boston, 24 years after the Pilgrims landed and 59 years after the first iron ore was located. This operation lasted until the 1670s when it was forced out of business by a labor shortage. The Saugus Iron Works was an integrated facility involving a dam to provide water for forging, a furnace for smelting, a trip hammer forge, and a rolling slitting mill. It produced two forms of iron. One was cast iron, which was directly poured in molds to shape whatever product was needed or cast into pigs. A pig was a lump of iron that could be remelted and cast later, but which was more often made into the second form of iron, which was wrought iron. Wrought iron was made by remelting the pig to reduce the amount of carbon in it and then forging it to refine its grain structure. This took a lot of power, but it yielded a very strong metal. Now, what do you suppose was the primary product of the Saugus works? What do people need when they're building cities out of the wilderness? They need nails and lots of them. A great deal of the wrought iron was milled out into thin strips which were then slit into small square rods. These were sold to individual householders who cut them into short lengths and used small dies to form points and heads on them. Nail rod production of this kind was rare in Europe at the time, but our needs weren't European needs. Construction was our first order of business in the 17th century. The Saugus Iron Works represented an intelligent, well put together, and even visionary answer to these needs. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we find a rejected invention that changed our world. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The Edison effect was the name given to a phenomenon that Edison observed in 1875 and refined later, in 1883, while he was trying to improve his new incandescent lamp. The effect was that in a vacuum, electrons flow from a heated element, like an incandescent lamp filament, to a cooler metal plate. Edison saw no special value in the effect, but he patented it anyway. Edison patented everything in sight. Today we call the effect by the more descriptive term, thermionic emission. Now the Edison effect has an interesting feature. The electrons can flow only one way from the hot element to the cold plate, but never the other way, just like water flow through a check valve. Today we call devices that only let electricity flow one way, diodes. In 1904, the Edison effect was finally put to use, but not in a light bulb. Radio was in its infancy, and the British physicist, John Fleming, was working for the British Wireless Telegraphy Company. He faced the problem of converting a weak alternating current into a direct current that could actuate a meter or telephone receiver. Fortunately, Fleming had previously consulted for the Edison and Swan Electric Company of London. The connection suddenly clicked in his mind, and later he wrote, To my delight 
I found that we had in this particular kind of electric lamp a solution. Fleming realized that an Edison effect lamp would convert alternating current to a direct current because it only let the electricity flow one way. Fleming, in other words, invented the first vacuum tube. Of course, most vacuum tubes have been replaced with solid-state transistors today, but they haven't vanished entirely. They still survive in modified forms in things like television picture tubes and x-ray sources. Fleming's discovery reveals an aspect of the creative process that comes at us again and again. The creative inventor takes ideas out of their original contexts and uses them in new contexts. He turns bread mold into penicillin, coal into electricity, or I suppose lead into gold, because he isn't constrained to keep each thought in its own container. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we reinvent the wheel. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. As nearly as we can tell from archaeological evidence, the wheel was invented somewhere in present-day Iraq or Iran around 3500 BC. That in itself is surprising because it's so late in human history. The other odd thing about the wheel is that it stayed within Europe and Asia as long as it did. Wheels were hardly seen in the American hemisphere until they were brought into regular use by European settlers in the 17th century. There's evidence that 11th century Mexicans had the concept, but no evidence of its general use. Of course, we've lived with a 100,000 different forms of the wheel since birth. It's hard for us to imagine what a difficult concept it represents, but look at it, if you can, from the standpoint of someone who's never seen one. You understand movement in a straight line, and you understand the idea of turning things around, but can you make a connection between the two? Can you conceive of making a vehicle go forward by turning something around? We've all played the children's game of patting our head and rubbing our stomach at the same time. It's very hard to do, because it's hard to conceptualize these two very different kinds of motion at the same time. The conceptual difficulties of the wheel are compounded if we move to a variation of the idea, if we move to the hand crank. The hand crank is another very common device that you might think had been with us since the dawn of history, but it has not. The hand crank has been in general use for only a thousand years. The Greeks didn't have it, the Egyptians didn't have it, the vaunted Romans with their much praised technology never arrived at this seemingly simple device. The hand crank, of course, takes the problem of converting back and forth motion of our upper arm into a rotational motion, and it freezes this transformation into one location. In a sense, it requires that we solve the problem of patting our head and rubbing our stomach at the same time. Most of the important ancient inventions seem to have been made over and over, at different times and in different places. Not so the wheel. It seems to have originated in one place and diffused to other peoples and other cultures from there. It was very likely the product of an isolated act of human ingenuity. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we ride in the world's largest land transport vehicle. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. What do you suppose the largest land transport vehicle is? A bus, a train, an earth mover? Actually, 
It's the crawler transporter developed for NASA to carry an assembled Saturn rocket on its five-mile journey from the assembly building to the launching pad. This strange vehicle makes more sense as an engineering accomplishment when we realize the magnitude of the task. It had to carry a 12 million pound rocket and launching derrick, and it had to keep them within 10 minutes of an arc of a pure vertical position while it negotiated grades of as much as 5 degrees. The crawler transporter was selected in preference to both a special barge and canal system and a rail system. What finally emerged was something out of science fiction. It's 131 foot long and 114 feet wide. It weighs 6 million pounds. The structure rides on four double tracks, each pair the size of a Greyhound bus. Inside its huge deck are diesel engines with a total output of almost 8,000 horsepower. They drive generators that supply electric motors for the tracks, for the immensely delicate leveling mechanism, for the cooling systems, and for other internal functions. The five-mile journey requires a highly trained crew of 11 people, a driver, four observers at different locations to advise the driver on steering, and six technicians. The crawler moves at two miles an hour unloaded and one mile an hour with the rocket in place. Its fuel economy is about one one hundred and fiftieth of a mile per gallon. And who built this high-tech behemoth? Actually, two were built, and they weren't products of the aerospace industry. They were made by the Marion Power Shovel Company of Ohio, a company with experience in heavy moving technology. The crawlers each cost $14 million in 1967 when they were put into service. This is the sort of design challenge that gives engineers enormous pleasure a new machine that must conform to a set of extraordinary requirements, an array of decisions and component inventions that molds dramatic function out of thin air. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we learn how the horse was put to work. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Western Europe was a pretty primitive place until a few centuries after the death of the Roman Empire. When it emerged as a new civilization, it did so because medieval engineers developed water and wind power and ultimately did more with it than the Romans had ever done with slave power. But this had to wait until European agriculture became productive enough to support towns with masons and artisans, people who did more than just labor for food. And that, in turn, required a more powerful beast than the plodding ox to pull plows through the heavy, wet northern European soil. It required that the horse be integrated into European farming. Horses were bred in great numbers for military use in Europe from the middle 8th century on, but three things made it hard to use them for farming. Their hooves became soft and easily hurt in damp soil. When they were harnessed in an ox yoke, their wind was cut off by any heavy load, and the horse needed a better diet than an ox. It couldn't just graze grass, it had to have protein. The nailed horseshoe and the horse collar solved two of these problems when they were introduced in the ninth century. The solution to the problem of feeding the horse was more complicated, but it also followed in the ninth century. The solution went like this. Ninth century farmers used two fields, one active at a given time and the other one idle or fallow. This kept them from robbing the soil of nutrients and leaving it unproductive. Then someone found that a field could be used two years out of three if it were planted with one crop in the fall and a different crop in the spring, a year and a half later. This meant that farmers had to break their holdings into three fields, one to be planted with wheat or rye in the fall for human consumption, the second to be used in the spring to raise peas, beans, and lentils for human use, and oats and barley for horses. The third field lay fallow. Each year, this use was rotated among the three fields. We remember the spring planting in the nursery rhyme. 
Do you, do I, does anyone know how oats, peas, beans, and barley grow? The odd thing is that this clever scheme took 200 years to adopt. The horseshoe and the horse collar were put to use directly. But the three-field crop rotation required people to rearrange real estate and to change their social order. For all its potential advantages, it was very hard to implement, and the great rebirth of European civilization that it led to was delayed until the 11th century. But that sort of thing is no surprise to us. We face the social problems of adapting to technological change every day. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we make calculations on the grandest computer of the early 1940s. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. We tend to view the computer as having come into being only during the past 30 years. No doubt it has come into its own during that period, but serious attempts to do complicated machine calculations were underway well before World War II. The most important pre-war effort was started in the 1920s by Vannevar Bush. It culminated in 1942 with the dedication of his huge Rockefeller Differential Analyzer at MIT, a 100-ton machine with 200 vacuum tubes and 150 motors. Bush's analyzer was an analog computer. An analog computer actually carries out an analogy of a real physical process, in this case, a mixed electrical-mechanical analogy. A digital computer is quite different. It breaks all computations down into sequences of additions and subtractions, and solves equations by doing a lot of simple arithmetic. Bush's computer quickly fell under the pall of World War II secrecy, but only after the head of the electrical engineering department at MIT had proclaimed that it would mark the beginning of a new era in mechanized calculus. And MIT President Compton had announced that it would be one of the great scientific instruments of modern times. When this wonderful device emerged from secrecy five years later, it turned out that it had slipped into obsolescence. The new breed of high-speed digital computers simply overtook it. Historian Larry Owens looks at this fall from grace and asks sadly, how does one tell the story of a machine? Owens concludes that the real importance of the fall is that it so clearly illustrates a change in the very character of engineering after the war. Bush, he observes, represented a kind of engineering that was in contact with a workshop. His computer was made up of complex mechanical and electrical elements. It thought the way pre-war engineers thought, in physical, graphical terms. The modern digital computer, he points out, speaks in a mathematical language to the more abstract and mathematical breed of post-war engineers. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the Friends of KUHF. Today we visit the first American steam engine. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The intelligentsia of 18th century America were quite interested in the technological revolution that was then sweeping England. In 1760, the young John Adams wrote in his diary that he was struggling to understand the English fire engines, as steam engines were then called. But the historian Carol Purcell points out that our interest in steam engines was largely academic, because the real thing simply wasn't to be found in the colonies. The early 18th century use of steam engines in England was pretty well limited to keeping water out of the relatively deep British coal and metal mines. On this side of the Atlantic, we made do for some time with surface deposits of coal and iron, so there was no great need for pumping engines. But a problem arose when we went after copper and other scarcer metals because they lay deeper in the earth. 
In particular, Colonel John Schuyler's copper mine near Passaic, New Jersey, was closed down by flooding in 1748. So Schuyler sent the English engine maker Jonathan Hornblower 1,000 pounds to ship him a fire engine, accompanied by workmen to help set it up. The engine arrived five years later in 1753, along with Hornblower's son Josiah and several mechanics. When Josiah got the engine into operation almost two years later, Schuyler hired him to run the engine and the mine as well. It ran well enough for five years until it was badly damaged in a fire. Josiah got it back into operation again, but only until another fire ruined it in 1768. This time it stayed ruined until after the Revolutionary War. Josiah Hornblower made another repair in 1793, and this time the old relic kept pumping well into the 19th century. But America wasn't built on off-the-shelf English engines. We were starting to build our own engines by the time of the Revolutionary War. Before Hornblower repaired Schuyler's engine the second time, it had been surpassed not only by better English engines, but by early American designs as well. It was by then something of an antiquarian tourist attraction. The real value of Schuyler's tenacity was that it pointed the way to others. Colonial intellectuals and writers visited the mine. Ben Franklin stopped by to see it. What was an intellectual exercise for John Adams was made real for us by Schuyler. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we look at windmills. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Don Quixote dwelt in the twilight of the age of chivalry in the 14th or 15th century, but he was a creature of the late 16th century author Cervantes. Early in the story he cries, Look there, my friend Sancho Panza, where thirty or more monstrous giants present themselves, all of whom I mean to engage in battle and slay. And he points to a very large presence of power-generating windmills dotting the Spanish landscape. The windmill rapidly came into wide use in Europe during the 11th century, 300 years before Quixote and 500 years before Cervantes. A debate had gone on as to whether it was brought to Europe from the Holy Land or vice versa by crusaders. The current best guess is that it originated in northern Europe. The water wheel had been in wide use for a hundred years when the windmill came along. Windmills were more complicated and they were at the mercy of sometimes fickle winds, but they could deliver more power than a water wheel and they made it possible to grind grain where there were no streams, in places like the Dutch lowlands or the Spanish plains. By 1760, windmills reached an astonishing level of sophistication. They were equipped with automatic regulators that controlled the speed of rotation, that adjusted the pitch of the fan blades for maximum power at a given wind speed, and that oriented the fan so that it always faced directly into the wind. When they were used for milling, they were equipped with devices that regulated the pressure of the millstones on the grain but it was also in the 1760s that Watt developed a vastly improved steam engine. As the 18th century ended, windmill development was abandoned in favor of these new engines. Watt was the Quixote who really slew the windmill. Of course, windmills didn't go away completely. Today, there's still a choice power supply for isolated use where there's no commercial electricity, for filling cattle watering troughs out in the prairie, for example. They played a large role in opening up the American West. Lately, we've seen a new interest in wind power. Latter-day engineers are concocting a dizzying set of improvements in the hope of using windmills for electric power generation. But 18th century windmills remain an almost forgotten glory that well might impress any engineer today. For example, the variable pitch propellers used in these mills over 200 years ago are an innovation that airplane designers didn't rediscover until the 1930s. <laughs> 
I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we'll visit Colonial America. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The mood of colonial America was one of confidence, self-assurance, and a passionate belief in freedom. For me, it's contained in an image from the summer of 1790, the sight of John Fitch's steamboat moving earnestly up the Delaware River propelled by an array of Indian canoe paddles. These paddles boldly proclaim Fitch's amateur but functional freedom from any engineering tradition. We have to understand the intensity of the colonial impulse to be free to understand colonial technology and innovation. The word freedom was much used and it swept in more than just political independence from England. It also included cultural freedom from Europe. The first significant American poet, Barlow, who repeatedly asserted our cultural independence, brashly called America a theater for the display of merit of every kind. Sometimes this impulse toward freedom was downright arrogant. A typical anonymous Revolutionary War song set to the skirl of fife and drum ends with the lines, and we'll march up the heavenly streets and ground our arms at Jesus' feet. Other times it resulted in simple expressions of pleasure, as in Francis Hopkinson's widely sung lilting melody, My days have been so wondrous free. But in either case, the direct, innocent, homemade, and somehow completely engaging quality of it captures our imaginations. It's strong, affecting, and completely amateur. Revolutionary America does that to you again and again. You see Jefferson's mansion at Monticello, of which Kenneth Clark says, He had to invent a great deal of it himself. Doors that open as one approaches them, a clock that tells the days of the week, a bed so placed that one gets out of it into either of two rooms. All of this suggests the quirky ingenuity of a creative man working alone outside any accepted body of tradition. You find self-taught Ben Franklin providing the world with really important and permanent insights into the nature of electricity. You discover a small band of homegrown intellectuals inventing a government of and by their people. The engineering of this new land had the mindset of people who knew that they could do whatever they wanted to do and do it better than and without reference to what had been done before whether it was designing the perfect capital city, building the Erie Canal, or marching their armies right up the heavenly street, they knew that nothing was beyond them. The worm of self-doubt afflicts so much of our technology today, but it was not to be found among these people. With clear, childlike self-assurance, they really did do the impossible. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we wonder about sails on powered ships. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Robert Fulton's original steamboat was equipped with two sails in 1807. American riverboats quickly abandoned sail because they always ran near a shore and because sail wasn't much use without a lot of room for navigation. But abandoning sail at sea after using it for several millennia did more than just violate tradition. It was a very frightening step to take. The American packet Savannah made the first transatlantic steamboat trip in 1819. At least it got almost to Ireland before its coal ran out and it had to run up its sails. When the British Great Western established regular transatlantic passenger service in 1837, it still carried sail. How long do you suppose it took to gain confidence to abandon the expensive backup protection of sails, masts, rigging, 
and extra crew. Actually, the beginning of the end of sail traces to the battle between the Yankee Monitor and the Confederate Merrimack in 1862. Of course, these powered ironclad ships didn't carry sail because they were shoreline vessels. But the Monitor had an entirely new feature. In the center of the boat, where a mast might have been, there was instead a gun turret. At this time, the conservative British Admiralty was trying to replace fixed guns on their ironclad warships with rotating turrets. Their problem was that masts and rigging interfered with the field of fire of a turret, a problem that the Monitor didn't have. The British clung to sail during the 1860s and built several ships with both turrets and masts. They had a lot of problems with them. Finally, in 1871, 64 years after Fulton, they took the bold step of launching the first ocean-going warship without any sail, the HMS Devastation. It set the pattern for future British sea power, but masts were still to be found on many merchant and passenger ships well into the 1900s, a full century after the first ocean-going steamboats. We have to ask whether we're looking at conservation of fuel or conservatism of mind. Indeed, some naval architects today talk about adding modern forms of sail to boost the power of merchant marine vessels. But though the engineers of the 19th century were many things, they were never conservationists. The long retention of sail represents a remarkable instance of conservatism in engineering. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the Friends of KUHF. Today, we look at an attempt to rewrite history. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The close of the 19th century saw Samuel Pierpoint Langley and Orville and Wilbur Wright laboring to create powered controllable flight. Langley worked with government support and enormous public exposure, while the Wright brothers worked quietly using their own resources. Langley attempted flight on October 7, 1903. His huge 54-foot long flying machine had two 48-foot wings, one in front and one in back. It was launched from a catapult on the Potomac River, and it fell like a sack of cement into the water. On December 8th, he tried again. This time, the rear wing caved in before it got off its catapult. Just nine days later, the Wright brothers flew a trim little biplane with almost no fanfare at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Their advantage was that they'd mastered the problem of controlling the movement of their plane and they'd preceded their work with four years of careful experimentation with kites and gliders. But the government makes an interesting bedfellow. Charles Walcott, a longtime friend of Langley who'd been influential in funding his work, was made director of the Smithsonian Institution in 1906, the same year Langley died. He immediately set up a Langley Medal, a Langley Aero Lab, a Langley Memorial, and then, in 1914, he funded Glenn Curtis, who had been involved in a bitter patent dispute with the Wrights, to reconstruct the Langley machine and show that it really could fly. Curtis went to work, strengthening the structure, adding controls, reshaping it aerodynamically, relocating the center of gravity, in short, making it airworthy. In 1914, he flew it for 150 feet, and then went back and replaced the old motor as well. On the basis of Curtis' reconstruction, the Smithsonian honored Langley for having built the first successful flying machine. In 1925, Orville Wright at last roused American opinion to his cause by placing the original airplane, this American treasure, in the Science Museum of London. In 1942, the secretary of the Smithsonian, Charles Abbott, finally authorized publication of an article that clearly showed the Langley reconstruction was rigged. Orville responded by telling the British that his airplane should be returned to the Smithsonian Institution after the war. He died in January 1948, and 11 months later, the first airplane returned to America, to the Smithsonian, where it now hangs over a label giving the Wright brothers their due. <laughs> 
Today, of course, Langley's name graces a major NASA center, an Army air base, and the CIA headquarters. But justice, nevertheless, seems to have prevailed for the Wright brothers. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we look for perpetual motion. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. When we talk about a perpetual motion machine, we usually mean a machine that produces power without being fed an even greater amount of power in a different form say an engine that produces electrical energy without eating up even more energy in the form of coal. For 140 years, we've all agreed on thermodynamic laws that tell us that sort of machine can't exist. But think for a moment like a medieval engineer. For years, you've harnessed the motions of wind and water. You've harnessed a lot of power, and you're hungry to harness still more. You watch a water wheel turn and turn and turn. You watch a windmill turn and stop for a while and then turn some more. Your eyes tell you that perpetual motion obviously is possible. Besides, the science of your day doesn't discriminate very clearly between physics and magic. The medieval engineer saw more magic than physics in the way windmills induced breezes to grind grain for him. And maybe we're the losers today for failing to see more magic than we do in such a process. In any event, the Hindu mathematician Bhaskara suggested a machine that would produce continuous power in 1150 A.D. It was simple enough. A wheel with weights mounted around its rim in such a way that they swung radially outward on one side and inward on the other. This wheel was supposed to stay forever out of balance and to turn forever. The Moslems picked up the idea in around 1200 A.D. and it showed up again in France by 1235. For the next 500 years, many writers recommended the use of this ingenious, if impossible, little device. You wonder, did they ever try to make one? Well, yes, they did, but it always seemed they'd failed to get the proportions just quite right. 17th and 18th century science eventually made it clear that the over-centered wheel wouldn't work. But then, after that, as each new physical phenomenon was discovered, people invented new ways of using it to produce power without consuming energy. People suggested perpetual motion machines based on static electricity, surface tension, magnetism, hydrostatic forces, and so on and on. Today, we still look for perpetual motion. Some people do it in the face of the physics that say it's impossible, but others look for as yet unthought of ways to keep producing power. But whatever we concoct, I think that we, like the medieval engineer, should be willing to see some element of magic in what we do. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we ride in the first modern passenger airplane. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Lost Horizons was one of my first movies. Do you remember Ronald Coleman stumbling out of an airplane crash landed high in the Himalayas into the mythical city of Shangri-La? I'll never forget it. The year was 1937, and the plane was one of the revolutionary new Douglas models that quite altered air transport in the mid-30s, and which are still being used today, 50 years later. The story of the Douglas DC-3 begins with the death of the great football player Newt Rockney in the crash of a Fokker trimotor in 1931. His death caused a public outcry over the quality of American air passenger service. The leading airliners were then the Fokker trimotor and its American clone, the Ford trimotor great machines in their day, made of plywood with a fabric and corrugated steel covering. 
TWA, then called Western Airlines, responded by contracting with the Douglas Company to build an airplane that could take off fully loaded on just one of its two engines and beat a Ford trimotor from Santa Monica to Albuquerque. Douglas did just that in 1933 with the experimental DC-1. Then they went into production with the 14-passenger DC-2 version and started service with TWA in 1934. The DC-2 was a great success, but it was clear to American Airlines that they'd have to carry more than 14 people. They contracted with Douglas, whose chief engineer, Bill Littlewood, wrote the specifications for a third and permanent model of this remarkable new plane. The result was the 21-passenger DC-3, which entered into service in 1936. By 1941, 80% of commercial airplanes in the United States were DC-3s, and they were still the most widely used airliner in 1948. What the DC-3 did was to combine all-metal stress skin construction, variable pitch propellers, and retractable landing gear into a two-engine low-wing monoplane that was safe, reliable, and easily maintained. It brought us from the airplane design of the 20s to that of the 40s in one step. Still, these new features weren't unique to the DC-2 and 3. A whole set of flying boats that had most of the features also came into being in 1934, bigger and with greater range. It isn't clear whether or not they followed Douglas' lead, but it's very clear that the DC-3 is still flying today, and they are not. 1934 has been called the miraculous year of American flight. What really happened was that a lot of good ideas emerged all at once. The DC-3 was the almost perfect combination of these ideas. It was the airplane to take us to Shangri-La. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we ask how war influences technology. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The common wisdom tells us that war speeds up invention, that airplane performance, ship technology, and engine design all raced ahead during World War I and II, that governments can speed the creation of ideas. But there's good reason to ask if this is really true. I'll use airplane speeds to show why I have doubts, but any other technology would show the same thing. Airplane speeds are a good thing to look at because we know how badly everyone wanted to speed up their planes during World War I and II. The important airplanes of World War II, planes like the B-17, the Messerschmitt 109, the Spitfire, they were all around before the war. The Spitfire was adapted from a peacetime racing plane, and it, like most fighters at the start of the war, flew about 350 miles an hour. By the end of the war, in 1945, the advanced P-38s and P-47s reached 420 miles an hour. The early German jet, the Messerschmitt 262, which was used in the waning days of the war, reached 585 miles an hour, but even it was on the drawing boards before the war. The remarkable fact is that throughout its history, the speed of flight has doubled every nine years. The rate of increase has been dead steady from the first primitive airships in the 1880s right up until orbital flight made speed a non-issue. That nine-year doubling has been absolutely untouched by war, depression, or presidential proclamations. The story also holds for World War I. In 1914, the early scouting planes flew around 80 miles an hour. At the end of the war, in 1918, the advanced spads could fly 134 miles an hour. And that's consistent with a simple doubling every nine years. In other words, once our creative energies were turned loose on the airplane, those energies went right on expressing themselves, war or not. What government commitment does increase during war is production. And make no mistake, the increase of production during World War II was nothing short of amazing. But human ingenuity is quite a different creature. It's remarkably impervious to external pressure. We're told that necessity is the mother of invention, but history doesn't really bear that out. The true mother of invention is our powerful driving internal need to invent. 
We invent because we want to invent. It's freedom that's the real mother of invention. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we ride 568 feet uphill in a barge. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. A storm rises over central New York, and a ferryman trudging beside his mule hauling a barge through the Erie Canal sings, Oh, the Erie is a rising, and the liquor is a getting low, and I scarcely think I'll get a drink till we get to Buffalo. The Erie Canal is deeply grooved in our national awareness. It was a marvel, a real marvel. Four of the Great Lakes lie above Niagara Falls, Superior, Michigan, Huron, and Erie, and they form a huge inland waterway with access to thousands of miles of shoreline, a waterway that touches Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, as well as New York. For our new country to be whole, East Coast commerce had to gain access to this waterway. But the inland port of Buffalo, New York, at the east end of Lake Erie, is 360 miles from Albany on the Hudson River. Worse than that, Lake Erie lies 568 feet above the Hudson River. Connecting the two ends with the canal was no routine task. In 1801, Thomas Jefferson appointed a Swiss immigrant named Albert Gallatin as Secretary of the Treasury. In 1808, Gallatin finished a proposal that we build a giant network of canals, including one between Lake Erie and the Hudson River. In 1810, the mayor of New York City, DeWitt Clinton, picked the idea up his support for the project got him elected governor of New York by a landslide in 1817. Construction of what was to be by far the longest canal ever built was ceremoniously begun on the 4th of July that year. The task took eight years and seven million dollars to complete. It involved building 83 locks, an 802-foot aqueduct to carry shipping over the Mohawk River, and countless other innovations. Yet the job was done by four principal engineers who'd never seen a canal. Like so much early American technology, the work was done by amateurs whose zeal and self-assurance took them where angels would fear to tread. The effect of the Erie Canal on this country was stunning. Cargo that cost $100 a ton and took two weeks to carry by road could now be moved at $10 a ton in three and a half days. Horses and mules drew barges through the canal in end-to-end, 15-mile -end shifts. And our ferryman sang the familiar song, I've got an old mule, her name is Sal, 15 miles on the Erie Canal. She's a good old worker and a good old pal, 15 miles on the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal completed one of Thomas Jefferson's dreams. It was a task that should have been beyond the engineers who did it, but they simply didn't know that. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we think about flying across the Atlantic. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Dozens of people had flown the Atlantic Ocean by the time Lindbergh made his historical non-stop flight from New York to Paris in 1927. The first flight was made in May 1919 from New York to Plymouth, England in a six-man, four-engine Navy flying boat but it stopped in the Azores and Lisbon on the way. That same month, Raymond Orteig of New York City offered a $25,000 prize for the first nonstop airplane flight from New York to Paris. Just one month later, Alcock and Brown flew a two-engine airplane nonstop from St. John's, Newfoundland to Clifton, Ireland. In July 1919, a British dirigible flew from England to New Jersey and back, and in 1922, two Portuguese aviators, Cabral and Coutinho, 
flew a single-engine British seaplane from Lisbon to Rio de Janeiro. That's a longer flight than Lindbergh's, but there's a catch. The flight didn't only involve a stop. They also actually changed airplanes on a small Atlantic island. More New York to England flights followed in 1924, and in 1924 a Zeppelin dirigible flew from Friedrichshafen to Lakehurst, New Jersey. Finally, in 1927, seven transatlantic heavier-than-air flights were made, of which Lindbergh's was the third. That might lead you to wonder what was so special about Lindbergh's accomplishment. Well, it was the longest non-stop heavier-than-air transatlantic flight and the first solo crossing. That's how he picked up the name the Lone Eagle. And, of course, his flight finally fulfilled the conditions of the Ortag Prize, which by then had been open for over eight years. Prevailing headwinds made it a lot harder to fly from Europe to America. The first solo heavier-than-air flight from east to west wasn't made until 1932. The pilot's name was James Mollison, and he only flew from Ireland to New Brunswick. And commercial transatlantic flights? Well, they had to wait until the late 1930s, about 20 years after the first transatlantic crossing and 35 years after the Wright brothers. Still, Lindbergh's flight was the one that riveted the public awareness, and it's worth saying something about his airplane. Lindbergh was a determined airmail pilot who finally found a like-minded designer at the tiny Ryan Airplane Company. Ryan specially built the Spirit of St. Louis in just two months' time for Lindbergh. They've called him Lucky Lindy. Maybe he was lucky for having found the right engineer at the right time. I'm John Leinhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's talk about window panes. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Glass has been made in various forms for about 4,500 years, but two features of glass making are surprising. One is that it was slower and more difficult to develop than we might realize. The other is that artisans could make really fine glass tableware long before they could make a decent window pane. The ancient Egyptians and Greeks made crude glass decorations, but today's basic soda lime glass, made of sand, limestone, and sodium carbonate, is only about 2,000 years old. The first glass of any real quality was made by the Alexandrian Greeks in North Africa around 300 BC. Soda lime glass came quickly on its heels, and both the Alexandrians and the Romans after them made it into very fine tableware. Fine tableware remained the main glass product for a very long time. Of course, the stained glass art in Gothic cathedrals was highly developed, and we might think that glass handling had reached a high level of perfection by that point. Actually, the thing that had reached a high level of perfection, and one that we may have lost today, was coloring the glass. A medieval window admitted light, but it was seldom smooth enough to provide a clear view. In fact, the windows of cathedrals were a way to tell beautifully lit Bible stories to the faithful who generally couldn't read. Medieval glass blowers made two kinds of flat glass sheets. One was made by blowing a large cylinder, then splitting it open and flattening it out while it was still hot. The other kind, called crown glass, was made by pouring molten glass out on a turntable and letting centrifugal forces spread it out from a central point. Crown glass became the basic form of flat glass for a very long time. It underwent considerable refinement, but even as late as 1800, most domestic windows still displayed the characteristic umbilical imperfection called a crown at their centers. Actually, the French had developed the superior but pretty expensive plate glass process in the latter 1700s, but the development of mechanized methods for making relatively inexpensive window glass weren't developed until the early 1800s, a scant 150 or so years ago. The lowly window pane serves to remind us of how much we take yesterday's great acts of inventive genius for granted. A window pane is the result of an enormously complex set of chemical and high temperature mechanical handling processes. I'm John Leinhard, 
at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we join George Washington at a balloon ascent. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. French ballooning began in 1783 when two paper bag makers, the Montgolfier brothers, began experimenting with hot air balloons. They made the first manned ascent on November 21, 1783, and 11 days later, Alexandre Charles tested a manned hydrogen-filled balloon, and the game was on. Benjamin Franklin was in Paris at the time, and he watched several of the first flights. When someone asked what good they were, he gave his famous answer, What good is a newborn baby? For a while, everyone was flying balloons, and they were reaching altitudes that were limited only by people's ability to breathe rarefied air. A man named Jean-Pierre Blanchard first flew four months after the Montgolfiers. Blanchard became the first barnstormer. He took his balloons on the road. That same year, an expatriate American doctor named Jean Jeffries hired Blanchard to take him from England to France in a balloon. They didn't speak a common language, but that didn't stop them from reaching a fine dislike for one another. Still, they did manage to make the first aerial crossing of the English Channel. Blanchard was an experimenter, the first to drop animals in parachutes, and the first to try to control his flights with sails and rudders. Then he took his act to America. In Philadelphia, he arranged to make the first American flight on January 9, 1793, just nine years after the first Montgolfier flight. The Quakers had built a modern prison that could be used to hide his takeoff from non-paying observers. He arranged to use it. Then he advertised in the Federal Gazette that people could watch the ascent for five dollars. He collected four hundred dollars and took off before a crowd that included President Washington himself. He landed in New Jersey and served his remaining wine to local farmers who, in return, gave his balloon a lift into town on their wagon. Blanchard died in Paris sixteen years later after suffering a fall. He'd made sixty flights, and then his wife continued in the business. Blanchard, by the way, used hydrogen in preference to hot air. His wife tried to improve the act with fireworks, and after 59 flights, she perished by setting her balloon on fire over Turin, Italy. Well, that's pretty awful, but their game wasn't self-preservation. It was excitement. And I'm convinced that technology is driven by people's excitements and enthusiasms far more than it's ever driven by the pursuit of purpose. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's talk about money. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Abstraction is at the root of invention, and one of the more interesting inventions was replacing real goods and services with the abstraction of goods and services that we call money, a medium of exchange. How do you suppose that happened? It actually took place in several stages. The first stage dates to the dawn of recorded history. As people from different places bartered and traded their produce, they needed frames of reference to set the value of goods. So they started referring the value of everything to such commonplace merchandise as cattle or metal. This process was generalized as early as 4000 BC by using the weights of certain metals, usually gold, silver, or copper, as a reference. You've heard the Bible refer to something called a talent. A talent was actually a unit of weight. Fifty or sixty pound copper talents were a regular medium of exchange around the Mediterranean by the ninth century BC. The next step was for governments to certify a particular medium of exchange. The Chinese did that in the 
8th century BC by inscribing certain exchanged goods. A century later, the Ionians put government stamps on their talents. And finally, coins, pieces of valuable metal inscribed with a government's guarantee that they had value even though they were separate from the actual goods they represented. Coins date from just after 650 BC when the Lydian Greeks first made them. We use the phrase riches Croesus when we speak of great wealth because the 5th century BC Lydian king Croesus was famous for minting standard coins made of natural gold-silver alloy. Within a few centuries, Greek coins had reached an artistic level that wouldn't be matched until modern times. The next level of abstraction was paper money, which has no value itself but which represents material goods that are held elsewhere. The Chinese used paper notes as early as the 8th century AD, but the widespread use of paper came about in England and France only about 200 years ago. Today, the whole process is being taken into computers. Our balance of cows, autos, and labor is being reduced to electronic record keeping, to credit cards and fund transfers. This is a level of abstraction in which all our goods and services are reduced to an agreed-upon figure of merit, call it the dollar or the yen, and weighed against one another in electric pulses. We still barter with each other, but the medium of exchange has become completely invisible. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the Friends of KUHF. Today we call up one of our favorite nightmares. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. I was 13 years old the night I made the lonely mile and a half trek back home from the movie theater where I just watched Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. It was a wintry night with a full moon flickering through naked branches whipping in the wind. And I tell you, I was flat out frightened to death. What makes the Frankenstein story such a powerful part of our folklore? Why is it so much more than just one more movie plot seen and forgotten? Mary Godwin, soon to become Percy Shelley's wife, wrote it in the summer of 1816 when she and Shelley and other members of Lord Byron's hippie entourage vacationed with Byron in Switzerland. Mary was the 19-year-old daughter of a noted feminist writer, Mary Wollenstonecraft Godwin. The group talked about creating a modern Gothic novel and agreed they'd each have a go at it. Mary was the only one who really succeeded, and she gave us the book Frankenstein, or The Modern Prometheus. It was a brilliant piece of work for someone so young, but it came out of a hotbed of post-industrial revolution intellectuals, steeped in a rising concern over what science and industrialization were doing to the world. Her young protagonist, Victor Frankenstein, tells us early on that my reluctant steps led me to M. Krempe, professor of natural philosophy, an uncouth man, but deeply imbued in the secrets of his science. And under Krempe's instruction, Frankenstein's Faustian quest for knowledge takes him to the terrifying secret of life. His product, the monster, is more articulate, more intelligent, and more able to feel pain than his human maker. The monster produced by Frankenstein's intelligence and creative drive had Frankenstein's intelligence and sensibilities, but in a kind of grotesque parody. In a curious way, Frankenstein and his monster merged together. Mary Shelley was unmistakably talking about the science-based technology of her day. The subject interested her. Later in her life, she wrote biographies of famous scientists for Dionysus Lardner's Cabinet Cyclopedia. Her Frankenstein expressed her recognition of the dangers that lay in our new powers. In retrospect, I had reason to be frightened as I scuttled home that night. Mary Shelley had summoned up a monster that can be found in any of us, the monster that Victor Frankenstein released when he let himself be obsessed by technical knowledge. In the end, the monster portrayed his obsessiveness. In the end, science and engineering can only serve human needs insofar as engineers and scientists learn to know and control themselves. I'm John Leanhard. 
at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we suffer a devastating loss by failing to trust a new technology. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. I'd like to begin by telling you just a little bit about radar. Radar is a concept that's almost as old as radio itself. The radio pioneers, Marconi and Tesla, both pointed out that we could locate metal objects by bouncing radio signals off them. And as early as 1904, a German engineer named Hülsmeyer patented a radio echo device for locating ships at sea. During the 1930s, all the major powers were trying to develop workable airplane and ship spotting systems that used radio waves. By the way, the acronym RADAR, which stands for Radio Detection and Ranging, wasn't coined until 1942 when the U.S. Navy started using it. American Navy and Army engineers discovered in 1936 that they could detect aircraft at distances of more than 100 miles when they used long enough wavelengths. They had mobile detection units in production by 1940. The first of these units were field tested in Panama, and late in 1941, five of them were being field tested in Hawaii. One of the Hawaiian units was stationed on the northern tip of Oahu on the night of December 6, 1941. Private Joseph Lockhart was training Private George Elliott, and they were to go off duty at 7 in the morning when a truck was to pick them up for breakfast. The truck was a little late, and Lockhart was trying to give Elliott some extra time on the unit. At 7.02, Elliott saw a very large reflection 160 miles due north of them. They tracked the signal for 18 minutes, then Lockhart called the information center, where the lieutenant on duty dismissed it as, in his words, nothing unusual. They went on tracking the signal until 7.39, when the 183 Japanese dive bombers and fighters that were creating it were only 20 miles away. Then the truck arrived to take them to breakfast, so they folded up their equipment and left. Sixteen minutes later, the planes hit Pearl Harbor. By ignoring the signal, we lost 3,000 men, dozens of large ships, and 80% of the airplanes on Oahu. Still, it's too easy to criticize short-sightedness. Radar was a new invention, and an invention is alien, or it wouldn't be an invention. We have to be introduced to it, gradually brought to understand what it can do. Unless it appears just when we're ready for it, it must be championed. The great inventions that have revolutionized the world were usually unrecognized in their first incarnations. The light bulb, the steamboat, the telegraph had all been invented long before Edison, Fulton, and Morse came on the scene to show us their full potential. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we meet our national namesake. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Our country is named after the Italian navigator Amerigo Vespucci, instead of the Italian navigator Christopher Columbus. But why? Who was Amerigo Vespucci and what did he do? He was an Italian merchant, born in 1454 in Florence and employed by the Medicis. They sent him to look after their ship outfitting business, which operated out of Seville, about the time Columbus made his first voyage. In fact, the business had a part in outfitting Columbus' third voyage. Vespucci finally outfitted his own voyage in quest of the passage to the Indian subcontinent that had eluded Columbus. He sailed in 1499, seven years after Columbus first landed in the West Indies. Vespucci made two voyages between 1499 and 1502, and possibly a third one in 1503. During his first voyage, he explored the northern coast of South America to well beyond the mouth of the Amazon. 
He gave names like Gulf of the Ganges and other Asian name places that he knew about to the things he saw. He also made significant improvements of navigational techniques. During this trip, he predicted the Earth's circumference to within 50 miles. But the big breakthrough came on Vespucci's second trip, and that was the realization that what he was looking at was not India at all, but an entirely new continent. He verified the fact by following the coast of South America down to within 400 miles of Tierra del Fuego. Columbus found the New World, but Vespucci was the man who recognized that it was a new world. And who wrote Vespucci's Christian name on the maps? The King of Spain? Our founding fathers? Vespucci himself? No, it was none of these. We were given our name by an obscure German clergyman, an amateur geographer named Waldseemüller. Waldseemüller was a member of a little literary club that published an introduction to cosmology in 1507. In it, he wrote of the new landmass that Vespucci had discovered, I see no reason why anyone should justly object to calling this part America after Amerigo Vespucci, its discoverer, a man of great ability. The name stuck, and when a second huge land mass was discovered to the north, the names North and South America were applied to the two continents. All this leads us to ask, who really discovered America? Was it the person who first found it, or the person who first recognized it for what it was? Perhaps I'd better leave you to decide that question. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we fall safely out of the sky. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. By World War I, parachutes were a pretty well-developed technology. Of course, they weren't given to fighter pilots. That was because they were still pretty bulky, but it was also because some people felt they'd have a bad effect on the morale and courage of pilots. On the other hand, the lookouts who manned frontline observation blimps were given parachutes, and they made heavy use of them. Those blimps were shot down with tedious regularity. The parachute was actually around for hundreds of years before the airplane was invented. The first well-documented parachute drop was made by the Frenchman Lenormand, who jumped from a tower in 1783. And it was also Lenormand who invented the word parachute. He derived it from the Greek meaning something that alters a fall. The usual accounts credit Leonardo da Vinci with the idea because he included a pyramidal cloth parachute in one of his sketchbooks in 1485. But the historian Lynn White has discovered an anonymous set of Renaissance Italian manuscripts on technology that he can date to about 1470, 15 years ahead of Leonardo. These include two sketches of parachutes. One shows a brace of long cloth streamers that clearly could have broken a fall. The other shows a parachute that's very similar to Leonardo's, conical in shape instead of pyramidal, but identical in all its other features. White asks how the idea got from this author to Leonardo. It's unlikely that Leonardo actually saw the manuscript because there were no patent laws in those days and people tended to be very secretive about their writings. But Renaissance engineers had what White calls an intensely oral tradition. A great deal of information was passed by conversation and the idea of the parachute was, as he wryly puts it, in the air during the Renaissance. And who made the first jump? Well, that seems to have been an anonymous Asian acrobat who used a large pair of parasols. But the parachutes that actually worked from large heights were made of loose fabrics in much the way these Italian engineers suggested. It's worth emphasizing that the motivation of such people was nothing more elevating, if I may get away with that word, nothing more uplifting than play. The parachute, like so much other worthwhile technology, was given to us by people who were simply having fun. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. <laughs>
This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's look at Fahrenheit's thermometers. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Daniel Fahrenheit, the man who put thermometry on a solid footing, was born in the Polish city of Gdansk in 1686. When he was 15, his parents both died from eating poisonous mushrooms. The city council put the four younger Fahrenheit children in foster homes, but they apprenticed Daniel to a merchant who taught him bookkeeping and took him off to Amsterdam. And there he found out about thermometers. The Florentine thermometer, invented in Italy some 60 years before, caught his fancy. So he skipped out of his apprenticeship and borrowed against his inheritance to take up thermometer making. When the city fathers of Gdansk found out, they arranged to have the 20-year-old Fahrenheit arrested and shipped off to the East India Company. He dodged the Dutch police until he became a legal adult at the age of 24. At first Fahrenheit had gone on the run, but then he continued traveling through Denmark, Germany, Holland, Sweden, and Poland to learn and to study. Ulrich Griegel, who tells Fahrenheit's story, notes that Florentine thermometer scales were quite arbitrary. No two were alike. Makers set the low point on the scale during the coldest day in Florence that year and the high point during the hottest day. Fahrenheit wanted to make thermometers to be reproducible. He realized the trick was not to use the coldness or hotness of a particular day or place, but rather to find materials that changed at certain temperatures. Isaac Newton had the same idea a few years earlier, but he wasn't a professional thermometer maker and he was ignored. Between 1707 and 1714, Fahrenheit worked out an alcohol thermometer scale based on three points. Zero was the freezing point of a salt water mixture, 32 degrees was the freezing point of water, and body temperature was called 96 degrees. Body temperature was a little off in this scale, but it was close. In 1714, he startled the world with a pair of thermometers that both gave the same readings. No one had ever managed to do that. Later, he made mercury thermometers that let him use the boiling point of water instead of the human body temperature. The turning points of inventive genius are subtle. Fahrenheit made sense of temperature by seeing temperature scales in abstract terms. He realized, independently of Newton, that the scales must be set by universal material properties. But he also did what Newton failed to do. He manufactured fine thermometers that carried his thinking into the world. I'm John Leinhard at the University of Houston where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we see what clocks have to tell us beside the time of day. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The mechanical clock was invented around 1300 A.D., give or take a little. 250 years later, clocks had become very sophisticated machines. Otto Meyer's book on the third century of clockmaking, The Clockwork Universe, 1550 to 1650, provides a remarkable insight, not just into the glorious clocks of this period, but into the nature of invention as well. As machines go, clocks have an odd character. You wind them up and then sit back and watch them carry out their function. A well-designed clock goes on and on, showing the time of day without human intervention and without self-correction. And so the ideal clock, the clock that we almost but never quite make, becomes a parable of divine perfection. By the middle 16th century, clocks weren't just accurate, they were also remarkably beautiful adorned with stunning but seemingly useless mechanical trimming. Robots marched out on the hour and performed short plays. Extra dials displayed the movements of planets. Clocks were crowned with exquisite miniature gold, bronze, and silver statuary. The intricate wheels and gears of these Baroque clocks became a metaphor for the solar system, for the universe, 
for the mind of man and for the very nature of God. The best minds and talents were drawn into the seemingly decorative work of clockmaking because clocks harnessed the imagination of 16th century Europe. All of this was rather strange because there was no need for precision timekeeping. Later, during the 18th century, the clock began to take its role as a scientific instrument, especially for its use in celestial navigation. But in 1600, the clock was primarily an aesthetic and intellectual exercise. Our thinking is so practical today. We'd probably condemn this activity as a misuse of resources. But the stimulus of the clock eventually drove us to unimagined levels of quality in instrument making. It drove and focused philosophical thinking. In the end, the precision of this frivolous high technology was a cornerstone for 17th century scientific revolution, for 18th century rationalism, and in the long run, for the industrial and political revolutions that brought in the 19th century. 16th and 17th century clockmaking was the work of technologists who danced to their own freewheeling imaginations and aesthetics, technologists who were having fun. That kind of technologist really changes his world, and make no mistake, these Baroque clockmakers set great changes in motion. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we learn how government secrecy sabotaged an early satellite. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Peter Likens, the president of Lehigh University, tells an intriguing tale about the first satellites. The first three satellites launched were the Russian Sputniks 1 and 2 in October and November 1957 and the American Explorer 1 in January 1958. Explorer 1 was long and narrow like a pencil. It was supposed to rotate around its own center line like a pencil spinning around an axis along its lead, spinning with the least inertia. It was definitely not supposed to rotate about an axis perpendicular to its center line, with its ends describing circles, in the maximum inertia mode. The radio astronomer Ronald Bracewell at Stanford University tracked the first Sputnik and determined that it was spinning in its maximum inertia mode. He knew about the dynamics of bodies that spin and consume a little of their own spin energy while they do, because that's how galaxies behave. What Bracewell knew, and what the Explorer engineers didn't know, was that the minimum inertia rotation of Explorer 1 would be unstable, that it would soon flip over and start windmilling through space. So Bracewell called the engineers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to warn them, but the people in charge of secrecy wouldn't let him talk with the engineers. He had to get the word out by publishing a paper in the open literature. It came out seven months after Explorer 1 was launched, seven months after Explorer 1 made just one Earth orbit and then flipped over to windmill from then on. Actually, in 1957, another engineer named Landon described that kind of instability in laboratory notes at RCA, but he didn't publish them, nor was he aware of the Explorer problem. Information that isn't made public can't do anyone much good. There can, I suppose, be good reasons for secrecy in technology, but make no mistake, Secrecy is an enemy of progress. Creativity, freedom, and openness are natural bedfellows. A Russian engineer recently pointed out why the United States stays ahead of Russia in computer development. Once we established a lead, he says, Russia tried to keep up by copying what we'd already done. They have plenty of ways to break through our security, but being forced by their system to play that game Instead of being allowed to trust their own inventive genius, they're trapped in a technology that's doomed to stay one step behind us. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. 
Today, let's talk about pins. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Needles and pins, needles and pins. When a man marries, his trouble begins, goes the old nursery rhyme. The lowly dressmaker's pin used to be a metaphor for the commonplace household necessities. Most clothes were made at home in the early 19th century, and dressmakers absolutely need pins. But pins were hard to make. People made them by hand in production lines, with each person doing one operation. The popular 18th century poet William Cowper described a seven-man pin production line in a poem that began, One fuses metal o'er the fire, a second draws it into wire, and which continued through to the final finished pin. But pin-making was actually more complex than Cowper made it out to be. The 18th century economist Adam Smith described 18 separate steps in the production of a pin. Small wonder, then, that pin-making was one of the first industries to which the early 19th century idea of mass production was directed. Stephen Lubar identifies the first three patents for automatic pin-making machines in 1814, 1824, and 1832. The last of these, and the first really successful one, was filed by an American physician named John Howe. Howe's machine was fully operational by 1841, and Lubar justly calls it a marvel of mechanical ingenuity. It took in wire, moved it through many different processes, and spit out pins. It was a completely automated robot driven by a dazzlingly complex array of gears and cams. When Howe went into production, the most vexing part of his operation wasn't making pins, but packaging them. You may have heard the old song, I'll buy you a packet of pins, and that's the way our love begins. Finished pins had to be pushed through ridges in paper holders, so both the heads and points would be visible to buyers. It took Howe a long time to mechanize this part of the operation. Until he did, the pins were sent out to pin packers who operated a slow-moving cottage industry quite beyond Howell's control. It's natural for us to glory in our grander inventions, in steam engines and spaceships. But technology also serves us by easing the nagging commonplace needs that complicate our lives. Howe's ingenuity in making the lowly pin easily available was a very large contribution to 19th century life and well-being. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we find some technologies that you don't see when you first look. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. A laser or a VCR is an invention that's right out in the open where we can see it. We admire such devices and we admire the people who made them. But have you ever thought how much ingenuity is hidden from view? How much ingenuity we don't even realize is there? For example, were you aware that gear teeth are far more than just wedges protruding from a wheel? That their shapes have been mathematically contrived so that smooth, almost flat surfaces push against one another without any sliding? Furthermore, gears are designed so the back of each tooth very nearly stays in contact with the mating tooth. That way, the gear can be reversed without backlash. Some very complex human ingenuity has been used to avoid the sharp edges, sliding motion, and backlash that wears gears out. Or consider the huge 12-foot-long Swiss Alpenhorn. Not many people realize that it's virtually the same instrument as the French horn in a modern orchestra, that some ingenious musician realized it was possible to roll that great length of tubing into a compact coil without losing tone. It's unlikely that you know what a complex mathematical shape an ordinary highway curve is if you're not trained as a civil engineer. These aren't simple arcs of a circle. They're made from two pieces of Archimedean spirals that start out straight, go to maximum curvature, and then return to straight again. That way, you don't have to turn your steering wheel all at once. 
Furthermore, the highway is banked from flat to a maximum angle and back to flat again. The shape is very complex. These examples go on. The sticky yellow paper squares you used to put a temporary note on a piece of paper came into being when an engineer at 3M Company invented a glue that didn't quite work. It wouldn't completely harden. So then he invented those remarkably useful stick-on notes to make use of a glue that couldn't dry out. An engineer doesn't have to build the Brooklyn Bridge or invent the radio to change the world. We encounter a thousand instances of dazzling ingenuity every day as we manipulate the machines around us. Creative expression is there among the anonymous parts of our machines as well as in our machines themselves. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. Mm -hmm.